joined by Dr. Claire Durant, who is a Race Against Dementia Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and doc, uh, not doctor, not yet. <laughs> doctor pending. <laughs> and Eric uh, Dine, who is a PhD student at Kent State University um, in Ohio in the USA. Hi, Eric. Hello, folks. Adam, um, how are you doing? I'm not, you know what? I'm not bad, actually. I'm, this is the home straight now, right? Last two hours, every half hour to go. I don't think we've had too many awkward, silent moments where half an hour, I think half an hour is the perfect amount of time that everybody's just left wanting a little bit more and I didn't have any awkward moments where I had nothing else to ask. <laughs> it's really impressive, Adam, all the work that you've done today with this. I've been watching since uh, before the sun came up today and it's just, it's incredible how much you're doing for this. I really appreciate your uh, dedication to the Alzheimer's community and our research. That's very kind of you to, to say, Eric. It's, honestly, it's not felt like a chore at all. It's felt like a real pleasure because I've met so many, uh, I know a lot of people I already talked to today, I already knew before, but um, hearing about some of the fascinating work and the variety that's going on is really inspiring. So honestly, if anybody's watching this who isn't a researcher, uh, do think about this. If you're still at university, do think about dementia research as a career because it's fascinating and what, you should have taken away from today if nothing else is it's that there this is not a done deal there is so much still to learn and so many new things are emerging all the time i'm going to talk about your work in a minute eric but i mean eric is a key example as somebody who's doing something that i don't think many other people are doing anywhere um but before we go to that i'm going to come to you first claire do you want to introduce yourself and i'm going to ask you to tell us i'm going to pick on you to tell us about the race against dementia uh, program mostly because I am amazingly envious of you because you've gotten to meet some awesome people that I, I I think are brilliant and gotten to kind of part of that fellowship comes is such so innovative anyway I'm going to shut up and let you talk tell us no absolutely well thank you so much for the amazing opportunity and really lovely to e-meet you Eric um, from across the sea so fantastic opportunity um, so yeah, my name is Dr. Claire Durrant. Um, I'm a Race Against Dementia Dyson Fellow working at the University of Edinburgh. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Race Against Dementia, this is our logo here. Um, it was set up by Sir Jackie Stewart um, in honour of and for really his wife, who very sadly is suffering from a rare type of dementia called frontal temporal dementia, which as if probably if you've been listening, is a type of dementia generally caused by tau pathology within the brain and tends to have more behavioral and memory symptoms, a bit like Alzheimer's disease. Now, Sir Jackie is an incredible icon in Scotland and around the world as a hero of Formula One. And the way he works is he takes risks and he thinks differently and he wants us to do the same in science. And he really believes in a kind of different way of thinking and that actually we've been studying Alzheimer's disease for many, many years. And whilst we have made progress, we're still missing that magic key to tell us really how we can improve lives of people currently living with the disease. We don't yet have a disease altering treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So what he wanted to do is said, I don't want to fund projects that kind of you know, build on what we've seen before in very kind of minute and small ways, which yes, are safer and that they'll probably lead to publications and they'll probably lead to your career progressing. He wants to take that big dive into dark, into the brain, and really look at some very strange, very out there projects using some of the best minds from across the world. So a lot of what we do in the Race Against Dementia is collaborating with different groups all around the world. Um, we work together to look at things like leadership programs, how we can think and how we can do research differently. So obviously Formula One is a big influence of ours and we look at how their team mindset and the really sort of focus on the end goal of the winning attitude constantly in Formula One. So Alzheimer's, every piece of research we should do is looking at that final goal, which is a treatment. And if we're ultimately not researching something that will benefit patients, is that something that we should be researching? So really that's- No, re no research for the sake of it. If this is not exactly. because it interests you, it's got to keep in that- Absolutely. Focus. And that doesn't mean basic science isn't important. My work is very much basic science. It's just that those basic questions, we have to fit into a jigsaw of a bigger picture and go, if this works, would it help someone? And if the answer is no, 
at the moment, you know, people, we need a cure and we need something that can improve the lives of patients. And all of the research I've seen today and around it, Alzheimer's Research UK and Race Against Dementia, that is our core principle. And that's what we should be working towards. So that's yeah, brilliant. it's a fantastic scheme and really focused on promoting early career researchers and giving us that chance to spend five years doing some awesome science with some awesome people. Um, but, I mean, bringing that, that approach to science. I'm not aware of this happening in any other uh, disease area. No, it's super innovative, innovative. And I think we're really lucky that we have someone like Sir Jackie, who's really flagshipping this. He's going on all of the TV programs and he's telling people we should be funding dementia. He's not afraid to tell politicians that it's outrageous that we're not funding more research into dementia. I know Alzheimer's Research UK had a campaign recently to try and get our government to spend just 1% of what it costs to care for people with dementia on actually trying to find a way of preventing or curing or treating or improving the lives of people with dementia. And I think that's quite a small ask. And I think people like Sir Jackie and Alzheimer's Research UK are really pushing that forward. And I, I love how hands-on this has been. This isn't, thank you, Sue, it's not been somebody who's just put some money in and then no. gone away and sat back, right? I mean, he's, he's no, absolutely. continued an interest in... No, so he's met with all of us personally. He has us with mentors in Formula One. We're doing lots of leadership training. For example, we've got this program called Hintzer where we get given a personal coach to talk about you know, motivation and working without burnout and even things down to nutrition. He really sees it as you know, working on the person as much as the research. So it's- Treating, been treating scientists it. like drivers. I mean, these are the yeah. same thing they do for drivers, right? And I mean, for him, it's all about the team and the team, is different in research in that it's often you're working in your own silo. That's quite a common way that we all work. We have our own project. We need our first author publications. But he's kind of trying to make us rethink the idea of team and that we're a team in our own labs. We're a team within people working in Alzheimer's research. And we're a team with people who are invested in research. So stakeholders like people who have Alzheimer's disease, people who have loved ones with Alzheimer's disease. We should all be pushing towards the same goal. And I think that mindset that comes from Formula One, which is the team and the engineers are the people who put the driver on the podium. We must never forget that. And whole institutions are just as important as individual scientists for changing that culture and saying, how can we all move faster in this really devastating disease? I, I honestly, I, I love that approach. And I wish, you know, some of the institutions that fund research uh, across the UK and elsewhere in the work, world would take that kind of take a new look at it and and if that means you know I don't know maybe next year they can learn from this and say hey we should rather than funding more we'll just give we'll just give the the um the race against dementia fellowship we'll just give you guys all the money and you can do a better job with it <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> well we're any new researchers, any young PhDs about to finish, um, the next round of applications is now open. So the deadline for that is in January. Um, so I really, really say go for it. If you have an idea, if you have a vision and you're passionate about Alzheimer's, really just, just go for it. I never thought- I saw, I, I saw the fellowship program yeah. extended in Australia as well, isn't it? Are they working yeah, with exactly. Alzheimer's Australia to fund a fellowship program in Australia as well? Yep, so he's really have a, has a very global mindset. He doesn't believe that Alzheimer's is going to be cured in a single institution. It's going to be cured by a collaboration of the best minds in the world. And I think he wants to use early career researchers as a kind of catalyst for sort of changing that and bringing these great minds together and also developing our own skills such that in five years time, hopefully we can be the ones who are driving these big consortiums and saying yeah. how we want Alzheimer's disease research to work. Whilst you don't want to lose that kind of, I think there's that combination between age and experience and youth and enthusiasm. Yes. I, I, I think um, whilst age and experience is valuable to keep around, I think, you know, there aren't many old Formula One drivers either, are there? Not because of <laughs> physical demands, you know, is it Max Verstappen was, you know, not even 20 or whatever. And this leads me nicely into talking about you, Eric, because I, I, you know, uh, Eric and I have met a few times and I'm Eric's biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> I love I, and I can't help but think this Eric but but that fellowship sounds perfect for you right I mean you're right. looking for a fellowship for your research nobody else is doing what you're doing this is interesting stuff and if you're looking for something that's a bit out there you're 
why don't we start? So I, I'm going to come back to you in a moment, Claire, to tell us about your actual work. But thank Absolutely. you for sharing details of the fellowship. Eric, tell us about your research. Right. And so I, I'd also like to say, I think that Sir Jackie's approach to dementia research is fantastic. I've had a similar thought, which is sometimes people are so focused on the end result and trying to get that nice paper that there are times where I just say, well, you know, what? maybe this doesn't fit in my grant, but I want to do this because I think it might actually work and may give us direction. So I think that's fantastic. And so with my research, what I um, use is nanoparticles, something that my Classical training through the sciences up until the point of grad school hasn't really included um, use of nanoparticles. So I joined a group at Kent State University and we're using nanoparticles to target beta amyloid. And by taking, the beta, by taking these nanoparticles and putting them within the beta amyloid fibrils, we can apply an alternating magnetic field that will interact with the nanoparticles and then create a localized heat that is mild, therm mild hypothermia. So what we've found is by using these nanoparticles and targeting them to the beta amyloid plaques, we can basically fragment them into something much smaller. And then we use human microglia to attack these new fibrils, these new small fragment fibrils. And we look at whether or not there's a difference between the phagocytosis of the large fibrils that of course, the ones we see in the Alzheimer's brain and now these newly fragmented ones. And so we found that there's an increase in phagocytosis of these newly fragmented beta amyloid peptides. And also there's a decrease in neuroinflammation. So this is just fantastic in terms that maybe beta amyloid isn't the driving factor. I personally think it is, but of course with the whole tau beta amyloid hypothesis, there's always gonna be that argument. But I think that if we can prove that targeting beta amyloid decreased neuroinflammation that maybe downstream we're gonna see other effects such as the um, uh, appearance of tau, maybe if we can slow it a few years, perhaps that will slow the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So that's basically what we're working on right now. And it's almost like I see it like a tree, that the tree was, the stem of it is using the nanoparticles to break up the beta amyloid, something that immunotherapy has been working towards for a while, with aducanumab and some of the other uh, monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies that they've taken to clinical trial. They haven't, some things have worked, some things haven't worked. And of course, Educanibab is going towards uh, a second attempt, I think. They're, they're trying to get FDA approval in the United States. But this is another way to do it. And we've shown that there is mild toxicity. The microglia can handle this, the neurons. We, I've read the literature has shown this is not necessarily dangerous to, to the neurons. So it's a safe approach to targeting beta amyloid. And now that we've done this, there's so much we can do now looking at what happens when we target beta amyloid. What, what is the effect of neuroinflammation in the long term? How does phagocytosis of beta amyloid affect later amyloid deposition? Does it slow tau uh, progression? So there's, that's what I do, and it's, um, it's been really exciting. We're putting our first paper out very soon. I'm just putting the last uh, edits on the draft, so we're going to be submitting it pretty soon so you can see about this research. But there's so much to it. I, I would love to talk about it for three hours, but of course, we don't have three hours. But that's, uh, that's the gist of what I do. I use nanoparticles to target beta amyloid non-invasively. That's super cool. <laughs> Thank you. It's right. It's not just me. I, I mean, and you, you've got to tell us about your machine that does this. <laughs> we oh the uh, so we have this monster. <laughs> I wish I, I've always been wanting to put up a photo of it. I haven't gotten it yet, but we have this very large alternating magnetic field uh, generator that all this energy then goes to this coil. And then we put in our sample, be it an animal or be it the cell, like the microglia with the nanoparticles within it or the beta amyloid fibrils. We turn it on and we induce this very powerful electric field. And then afterwards we, we uh, see the fragmented, um, beta amyloid but if we put a piece of metal in it it just immediately turns red it is so powerful it's just it, it's super cool to work with <laughs> i'm always like telling people around the lab like watch out i'm about to turn this on don't bring your keys in here <laughs> oh that could make a good cheese sandwich though <laughs> <laughs> right it's 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 a lot of, it's been a very exciting um process and there's something definitely off the beaten path it's something that we don't hear about very much using nanoparticles to target beta amyloid using heat so if, if anybody is interested um uh, eric very kindly recorded a webinar for us uh talking about his research in more detail with slides and 
proper explanations and everything. So if anybody's interested in that, if you're watching via YouTube, if you scroll down a few pages, you'll find uh, a link to Eric's uh, webinar in there. Do it's, it's only half an hour long. It's fascinating. Do go take a look um, and don't steal his ideas because he, he needs that <laughs> fellowship. <laughs> he needs that fellowship. And you, you're quite happy to come and work in the UK. That's right, Eric. Let's just get that Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. Edinburgh is a pretty good place to work, I gather. Edinburgh is an amazing place. Let me just say, the weather might not be, but the landscape, the people, the science can't be beaten. So. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear, but we have monstrous thunderstorms today in Ohio. So I'm just gonna like, oh, this, I guess I get used to the UK weather. <laughs> <laughs> it would take too much adapting. So, so Claire, thank uh, and Eric, thank you very much for sharing sure. that. Uh, Claire, so you, you very kindly told us about the, the, uh, approach this this amazing new approach and the risk against dementia fellowship or foundation and so so tell us particularly about what they're what they're funding you to do yeah so my work's kind of a bit of the opposite end of the spectrum to eric so i'm really interested in the protein tau that i'm sure other people have heard is one of the proteins that forms these sticky clumps inside nerve cells as it progresses through alzheimer's disease but one thing i'm really interested in is that tau is not going to be a villain by nature. It's present from birth, it's present throughout our life, and it's even been found as early as sharks and lampreys and sea anemones within our evolutionary tree. So tau does not equal bad. But why does tau turn into this kind of nasty predator, if you like, in our brain that we know can kill nerve cells and we know can destroy the connections between nerve cells called synapses? Now these connections I'm most interested in in Alzheimer's research because they allow nerve cells to talk to one another. And if we break down that connection so they can no longer talk to one another, we get the symptoms that we associate with dementia. So things like memory loss or forgetting um, your family members and behavioral changes. That ultimately comes down to whether or not these nerve cells can talk to one another. And one of the things I'm interested in is that normal tau, so tau that's not in this sort of clumped mass, might be quite important for keeping these synapses healthy, for keeping them talking to one another. And actually the processes that cause dementia and cause tau to go into this big sticky mess could also disrupt this normal function of tau. So I'm really interested in trying to understand what this protein normally does, why it goes wrong in Alzheimer's, and whether that could lead to loss of these connections between the nerve cells. Now, Eric's already really kindly mentioned a really cool cell type that I'm very interested in called microglia, which are the resident immune cells of the brain. Now, they're known to destroy synapses under some circumstances, but recently some signals have been discovered which can sit on the surface of the synapse that effectively are massive stop signs. They say, don't eat me. And if you have these signals on the surface of the synapse, microglia don't touch them. Now, interestingly, in Alzheimer's disease, it looks like we might be losing these signals. And one of my theories is that normal tau might be important in preserving those signals at the synapse. And if we lose normal tau, it rushes into these big clumps. We lose those don't eat me signals and the microglia go crazy. So I've sort of been listening in, in and out all of today. You've been talking a lot about how we study Alzheimer's. And my favorite model system is something called the brain slice culture. You can see the thing that looks a little bit like a planet on my right hand side. This is actually a section of mouse brain that we can keep living in culture dishes for several weeks. So this is actually 12 weeks old, this culture. And you can see the nerve cells in green are all kept in this beautiful sort of spiral architecture. Now, obviously, there's issues with modeling Alzheimer's in mice in that we have to give them something artificial in order to really say it's Alzheimer's. So my project has sort of taken my expertise from my PhD, which is working on these mouse models of Alzheimer's, to say, well, can we do this in humans? Now, to get living brain from a human is a bit of a tricky thing. Most of us don't want to donate our brain. But there are groups of people who need to have pieces of their brain removed whilst they're alive. So this is my neurosurgeon's end of book case. <laughs> so some people with, for example, epilepsy or brain tumors, when the neurosurgeon has to go to remove that area of pathology, so for example, if you have epilepsy in part of the hippocampus, or if you had a brain tumor, say, sitting here, in order to actually get their tools into that section, they have to cut out a normal piece of brain. Normally, this just gets thrown behind the surgeon into a bin and disposed of. But with permission from the patient, with informed consent, we can actually take these pieces of brain to the lab, 
take very thin sections of them and keep them alive for several weeks in culture dishes. So real living pieces of human brain with all the different cell types that we can then test drugs on, we can add amyloid like Eric and see what this does to synapses and look at how affecting different drugs and affecting microglia or tau might influence those synapses. So as you might have guessed, this image on the left, this is a living human brain neuron from a patient who had epilepsy surgery removed. So effectively my work is trying to use more kind of human models, but obviously complementing that with the mouse, which is a lot easier to do in sort of bigger numbers, to really try and understand what's going on at the synapse and how can we appropriately target tau so that it doesn't lose normal function, but gets rid of toxic. So it's all about a balance, like a bell curve in my head. <laughs> So I've, I've got a couple of questions here, um, I'm, but before I ask them, I'm going to remind uh, anybody watching on YouTube or Zoom, you can post your questions to us. You can use the um, comments box in uh, YouTube, or if you post using the Q&A box in Zoom, you can do that. I will also check Twitter if you're listening on Periscope, you can post a question on hashtag Chatterton in there. So uh, two questions. First of all, one is a bit simplistic for what you've just described, but um, so are many people, I mean, are there, because you're the first person today to talk about working on living tissue that's been collected in this way. Is this, is this something that there are many people working on? Or is this, again, back to your looking at unique approaches? I can't, yeah. I've not heard of that before. It's a very new technique. So um, I'm very lucky. I have a fantastic collaborator in Germany called Dr. Henne Koch, who works on this technique. And he's been doing it a lot as an epilepsy researcher. But really, the first publications of this were only out sort of two, three years ago. So it's a, it's a very new technique, and it's one that's still very experimental. So unlike working with mouse, where if you follow a certain procedure, you know that it's going to work 99 times out of 100, the human tissue you get is a lot more varied. So you would never want to put an entire project just on this. There's lots and lots of complications, but with that sort of hanging fruit of that temptation, if you can actually get this piece of brain to work and if you get a really nice surgical sample, sometimes you're lucky and you can get 200 slices, 200 dishes from a single sample because you can get quite large chunks of brain sometimes in these operations. And that gives you a huge opportunity to test different drugs in the same biological tissue. So you know that you know, even if there's variation between individuals, you can still see, does this drug treatment increase or decrease synapses in this person? So, yeah, so getting as many slices from one person is yeah. obviously valuable. And, and do you have to then respond with your studies quickly to that? Or can this be, because this can't be frozen, I guess. This is No, no. So, um, you know, it's, it's not something you want to do if you have a very strict schedule of other things you want to do in the lab. So um, I've had a call at 6 p.m. the day before to say that we've got surgery coming in the next day and then it's a whole day of procedures to obviously um, make sure everything's ready. You've got to wait outside a surgery room. You don't know when the surgery will be finished. And then a surgeon hands you a piece and you've got to run back to the lab. So it's a very much like a, it's, it's a stressful involved process. Um, and yeah, you have to drop everything when the human tissue comes through because it's fairly unpredictable. So I have another question now then. Um, <laughs> Again, dumb questions, but um, so people donate organs and they're kept alive, but so you can't collect a brain donation before it's too late by then. You can't collect a brain donation in the same way like you can heart liver. I mean, it would have to be pretty quick. And I think, you know, by necessity, post-mortems, there's, there's things that need to be done. There's a sort of a process. So really you really want to minimize the time from collection to harvesting. So it might be possible, but I'd be very concerned that, you know, the, the post-mortem process would affect it. And obviously the absolute priority in any human tissue work is the patient, you yeah, know, cool. wait five hours and the tissue doesn't come because the patient is the priority. That's fine. You know, and this is how we do research, you know, and I think again, with post-mortem, the most important thing is the family or the legal processes that happen. And, you know, maybe one day we'll develop a technique that can go around that. But ultimately, you know, research should never come before, you know, no, no. Sort of keeping I, I, patient I, I dignity. Love, I'd love a crack at that challenge, though, trying to resolve that logistical issue of getting you more donations. That sounds like no, a, absolutely. an interesting challenge in its, in its own in its own right. Um, and uh, do you have enough? I mean, I'm assuming is there more tissue? If there's somebody happens amongst the 
the 70 people that are watching us right now that <laughs> is there a particular procedure that people are having that if they know they could ring up and go you know what i really want my bit of brain to go to claire so usually if someone's having um, part of their brain removed for epilepsy um, procedures, so to stop seizures um, or brain tumour operations, those tend to be the two most common. Um, but again, it will be a case of neurosurgeons within your centre. If they're collaborating with someone like me, they'll have specific forms and things. I love a car play for that. And, and I had one more question, which is um, those signals that you, ch you said in the brain that weren't, um, do we know how to change those? If it turns out those signals are incorrect. Do we? Is there already a known mechanism to change to re to change those signals, or is that something we'll have to learn as well? It's something we'll have to learn as well. I think you know, as Eric probably knows, microglia signaling. We have some idea of how mm -hmm. they neurons, but there's a huge black box in there that we're still trying to work our way through as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our next guests have arrived, and honestly, I. I, I've said this a lot today, but I really do feel like we've only just scraped the surface. And Eric, I, 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 I we didn't get as much chance to talk. But honestly, if anybody's interested in Eric's work, that that webinar will tell you all you want to know. It's it's in the YouTube channel along with our other ones. It's, it is fascinating. Thank you. I mean, nanoparticles sound it sounds absolutely <laughs> awesome. So I'll definitely check it out. <laughs> Thank you. Your research also seems really fascinating. I love that. I love the organ in the dish concepts, and we can, we're learning so much. It's the great, greatness of 21st century science. Absolutely. <laughs> you should make contact with each other. And, and Eric, go find out about that Race Against Dementia Fellowship. But I've got a feeling that that could be a... You get option. badges. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, thank you again, Adam. And um, again, anyone watching, please, please do donate because every penny really makes a difference to people living with dementia and researchers like us. So thank you okay. for watching and thank you for donating. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Claire Durant and Eric Dyne uh, for joining us there. Thank you very much. Bye.